and access is about your airports. Um, IATA has just recently released some statistics that indicate there's over $600 billion of airport investment uh, ongoing at the moment, and $200 billion of that is in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, some of the major airport projects around the Asia-Pacific region at the moment include four major airports which are actively being planned and designed and constructed in China at the moment. Uh, Taiwan Airport is looking at a new $2 billion Terminal 3. As you mentioned, Hong Kong International Airport is looking at a third parallel runway, new Terminal 2, new remote satellite concourse. Bangkok Airport is looking at Phase 2 development, plus, which includes a new domestic terminal at the new airport and also a third runway. Jakarta's uh, looking at a new third parallel runway and also a Terminal uh, 4. Singapore Airport is looking at a third parallel runway and new Terminal 5, and they're only still constructing Terminal 4. So they're still planning ahead for Terminal 5. Uh, and the list goes on, and I could talk about Australia and New Zealand and, and, and other places. Uh, and they are, um, each of these countries have a systematic process of looking at demand of this type of infrastructure and also a process of uh, approval and implementation. Um, what I find here in the Philippines is it's a little bit less structured. Um, it's a little bit less structured. Less structured. <laughs> There's certainly uh, planning that takes place, but I find it's not enshrined in, in policy and sometimes the planning is not necessarily as robust as what it needs to be in order to make sure that uh, you do follow on to those implementation stages because without robust planning, there will always be issues that come up at later stages that uh, delay, delay the implementation. Um, now, the other point I'd like to make is the significance of capital city airports uh, and um, all of those projects I mentioned, in, uh, most of them are taking place at the capital city airports in the Asia Pacific region. Um, the capital city is the gateway to the country in most situations. It's where the seat of government is, it's where the centre of business is, and accessibility to that for any one country is, is critically important. Uh, and so that's uh, very important in terms of making the country regionally competitive. Having said that, inclusiveness of a, for the rest of the country is also about development of the domestic airport network and other international gateways. Um, and um, once again, um, in order to, to make regional areas accessible, it's the airport is critical to that, and there needs to be more happening in terms of regional airport development. Do you see a ray? Where would the ray, where would the light come in? Give us hope. Where is the hope coming in? The World Economic Forum says that, like seaports, we are the lowest among the ASEAN six nations. Uh, do you see this? Do you see this changing anytime soon? And where can we fan the flames that will actually get us traveling faster? Um, progress has definitely been made in recent times. I have to say that uh, the um, privatisation of Mactan Cebu International Airport is definitely a positive. Um, and that we'll see now the rapid development of a new terminal and the refurbishment of the existing terminal at Mactan Cebu Airport. There's a lot of talk at the moment about the new airport in Manila, of course. Um, and there's still a lot of talk about the development of Clark Airport. Um, however, I must say that that talk has been ongoing for some time, many years in fact. So, once again, there's a lot of interest and there's a lot of discussion and there is planning that takes place, but we're just not seeing the follow-through uh, that's required uh, on the airport sector at the moment. Okay, let's go to Ellie. Ellie on PPP. Good afternoon, everyone. Infrastructure, 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 indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting us. I'm Eliam from the PPP Center. Um, 
update on where we are. Um, I'd focus on three areas. One was, was in, on projects. We have so far already, when, since we launched the PPP program with the Kino administration, awarded nine projects. Total of 2.8 billion US dollars. I quickly mentioned them. Danghari School Building, Naya Expressway, School Building Project Phase 2 of DepEd, Orthopedic Center, Automatic Fair Collection, Cebu Airport Project, uh, LRT Line 1, Cavite Extension, O&M, and Integrated Southwest Terminal Project. Um, 13 under rollout, meaning in the process of have, they have been to the formal bidding process. We've issued invitations to bid already. Um, integrated Transport, South Terminal, Bulacan Bulk, um, Operation and Maintenance of LT Line 2, the Laguna Lakeshore Project, um, six O&M and expand development projects of airports. Lagindingan, Bohol, Puerto Princesa, Davao, Bacolod, Iloilo, the regional prisons facilities and the Cavite Laguna Expressway project. We both issued invitations to bid um, last Friday. Um, two other, three other projects, total of 2.5, 4.8 billion US dollars for rollout, meaning we'll soon be issuing invitation to bid. Uh, the Vausasa and Lex Lex Connector, the NSRP North South Railway project, and two others for another board approval, hopefully within the next three weeks, the motor vehicle inspection system and the very ambitious Manila Transit System Loop, the subway project, and several others. Total pipeline of 61 projects, uh, the total 26 billion US dollars, all to be pursued as PPP. We, all, we must note, however, that this huge infrastructure requirements that we have are not going to be done solely as PPP. There are several other financing resources, government budget, official development assistance. As mentioned by DOE, there are several projects lined up with um, ODA support. The other area that I think we should also be aware of is policy. A lot of the constraints on the way we make these projects move faster, as, as we, have, we should have done several years ago, are policy. The, Secretary, the Senate President himself mentioned a while ago, priority bill in Senate right now, we came from a hearing this morning, amendment of the BOT law into the PPP Act. So we're very happy it's moving very fast, hopefully to be um, enacted within the year, both in the House and in the Senate. In the meantime, I've also um, initiated some policy and process improvements on the way we do PPPs, standardization of contracts, some circulars on um, desperate resolution, viability of financing, termination payments, an EO was issued on disparate resolution, now mandated to be incorporated into uh, PPP projects, meaning alternative uh, disparate resolution mechanisms incorporated into PPP contracts. Uh, of course, strengthening local government's mandate over PPPs. We've um, clarified for them a, their PPP options, BOT law, joint venture, and we came up with a PPP code. Of course, um, it was raised this morning the need to clarify uh, authority of local governments over projects of national significance. Uh, that, I understand, isn't enough. <laughs> it's a lot more we need. We need them yesterday, several years ago. Um, last point, capacity of the implementing agency. Capacity to find technical, financial, operational, engineering solutions to make this PPPs work. And that's, of course, an ongoing work. And that's, I think, where uh, an important point raised this morning, continuity, sense of urgency and a sense of continuity. Thank you. Ellie, one of, this was one of the bright lights, the promises of the Aquino administration early on. And uh, it was choked a little bit at the beginning, but DPWH cleaned up during that time, right? And then during that high growth, that 7.2% growth rate, the PPP promises didn't materialize, and this may be too little too late. Is that a correct impression? Can, you, can it move faster than, than it is now? Uh, yes, it started out rather, uh, I would have used the word slow, but careful. We're careful in ensuring that the projects we put out to the market are PPP, properly prepared project. At the end of the day, the diligence we put into its preparation would spell successful bidding and implementation after. Uh, of course, as you know, this has moved on, gained ground, and we are now um, unprecedented um, 10 projects right now in the nine in the, in the market, and nine awarded in, in four years. 
uh, done in previous administrations. Thank you. Thank you. We just heard your speech um, earlier, and you're, you basically said that the spot market is on its way, is working. Is that correct? Could you, could you tell us, so it's been a little bit over a year since we had this, uh, when power, the WESOM was in the news and it looked like there was, at the very least, collusion among the power players. Sorry, not, not in any way, right? But how, I guess, where are we with that? Sorry, my, my philosophy here is really, let's surface it, let's talk about it, and then hopefully let's solve it. Well, uh... I think you're talking about November last year, yes. the incident that's uh, being investigated by the Energy Regulatory Commission. But in the, in the meantime, they have placed a secondary cap on how much the highest bid or highest amount should be. Because normally, the highest bid price would be the price. So they had a cap in the meantime that they are investigating. But of course, the private sector uh, is not happy about this regulation to a deregulated uh, sector, but that is a, a transition solution. But um, th um, there have been comments on uh, USM as uh, needing some uh, improvements, so there are reviews ongoing and we're working with the stakeholders, the other partners in the energy family. So in fact, I mentioned that there is a public consultation which we're conducting toward by the end of the month uh, to review the existing uh, protocols, regulations, and if needed, we'll amend them or have more of the regulations to guide the players in the market. Did you find any systemic problems that you needed to focus and solve? I think I'll attempt to answer, but maybe you can help me. <laughs> uh, I think um, one of the major uh, concerns at the moment is that we do not have that much excess capacity. So because the, the excess that will be uh, traded in the market is so thin, then chances are prices are high. No? So it's really a, a matter of building capacity so that we can have a better competition. Please, go ahead. Yeah, uh, actually the lack of capacity stems from two things. One is uh, there's no lack of people who want to build power plants. Is that that some power plants were delayed for one reason or another. And a lot of it has to do with permits. Um, and some of it has to do with getting transmission lines in time uh, for when those power plants are built. And, and uh, also the other issue is getting financing because when you finance a power plant on a project finance basis, they require everything to be there, all the permits, including ERC approval. Otherwise, the banks will say, well, you can go ahead and build it, but on your balance sheet, not with my money. Did you find anything systemic that you feel needs to be addressed immediately? Um, well, I think uh, it's our duty to, to find a way to address all of these, but you can't just address one, you have to address all of them simultaneously because it's the, the weakest link in the chain that breaks the, 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 the rope, right? So you've got to do it, if, even if you solve two or three problems, if you don't have a transmission line, you're still stuck. So you've got to solve all those problems at the same time. But is WESOM as a system, because we've shifted uh, over towards this, does it work? Sorry, when you this, we sub, this, this spot market yes. buying of No, the spot market definitely works. It reacts to the, uh, uh, what we call the price signal. When prices are high, people uh, come in and want to... The, the problem is that when you have a price cap, uh, it, it, uh, it, it tempers the prices in the market, but it doesn't attract new uh, power plants. It, it doesn't bother the baseload plants, but very few people want to build a peaking plant when there's a price cap, because that's how they make their money. So if you take away half the revenue, they're less likely to come in and build a plant. So that's a problem that has to be solved. Thank you. Michael, your last up um, on seaports. Please give us your thoughts. Well, of course, <clears throat> Doris has covered seaports uh, at length. I would like to be a little bit more specific, but add one point uh, to, to her domain, so to speak, and that is domestic shipping. Uh, we feel that domestic shipping industry th needs to be unshackled from unreasonable restrictions and red tape to compete in an integrated ASEAN. Maybe she was too shy to say that, but uh, I think it's very important. <laughs> now, um, 
Let me give you some good news, an overall uh, array of good news, and then go into more specifics and go into an area of uh, contention, which is the so-called port congestion. And I will say a few words to that one as well. The good news are Subic and Batangas ports have increased their utilization levels, and more feeder shipping lines are now serving these ports. Uh, 24 by 7 straight drug lines have been established. Government has appointed Secretary Almendras as coordinator, and there is an ongoing dialogue between government and industry with both sides contributing goodwill, time, and efforts to understand each other better and achieve, achieve efficient uh, competitive operation of the country's ports. Then certain CIQ, customs, immigration, and quarantine related costs have been uh, reduced or eliminated. The Senate has passed a law which, upon concurrence of Congress, will allow the shipping of international cargo on domestic legs, hopefully reducing the high cost of shipping to and from the Philippines, and the need to have direct access feeder cost, possible exclusive for cargo movements between NLEX and uh, SLEX, has been realized. So there's a lot of heightened awareness on how important the ports are, how important logistics is as an enabler of, uh, of progress. Now, a few further facts which may come as to your surprise. We looked at the port utilizations in average. Don't be mistaken, I mean, there have been peaks and there have been excessive peaks in port utilization last year, and you, ha you have felt the effects. But in reality, the Luazon International Ports, Subic and Batangas, are at 12.26 and 32.77% utilization still underutilized. In fact, it's you know, the consistent, uh, coordinated, planned use and expansion of these ports which are important. But if you look at it as, as an average, they are still, still underutilized. And even Manila, if you look at the average, they, are, they have been performing last year at 74 to and 78% ATI and ICTSI. So in average, it's just about right. Obviously, the problem was a different one. It was not the ports by themselves, now going to the port, so-called port yeah. congestion. What I'm saying is well-meant, probably correct decisions to regulate certain parts of the logistics industry, such as trucking, with respect to truck uh, axle loads, pollution standards, allowed age of vehicles, registration requirements, restrictions as to where and when the delivery goods of goods are allowed, the so-called truck bans, right? We are implemented without much coordination amongst different government institutions, and there was little, if any, appreciation of the resulting consequential cost increases and the impact to Philippine business and its competitiveness. Now, just a few words as to the cost. I think nobody real accounted and uh, calculated the cost, but just a few things to, 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 to ponder. Tripling of, uh, of trucking rates from Manila ports to the Calabas zone from about $200 to six to $800 per container, which is still the case right now, just probably went out a little bit. Demorage storage and detention charges combined with penalty cost Philippines cost to the, uh, the, in, uh, the Philippine importers uh, had to pay estimated minimum 100 million US dollar, probably a multiple of that. But I, I have personal knowledge that uh, there were importers who had cost, additional cost just for demorage and uh, detention of about almost a million US dollar. Now, shipping lines imposed congestion surcharges of 200 to 500 dollar and equipment imbalance surcharges likewise. If you add that all together, I'm estimating the cost per container is probably a thousand. You multiply that a thousand dollars. So you multiply that by the number of containers which came in, you arrive at the damage. Uh, everybody's at ease right now. Government says the port uh, congestion is uh, resolved and for now it is. Uh, the fact is we are in low season right now and furthermore, the market has reacted to the increase in prices. Obviously, now the truckers are charging three, four times as much, so you have more trucks now serving the ports. But the productivity is still rel relatively low. For me, the key factor there is productivity of trucks. Used to be about 25, 
uh, container deliveries per month went down to 10, and that's why it tripled, tripled the cost. And by now, it's back to about 14, 15. So yes, there was an improvement. Yes, we have more trucks. Yes, it's low season right now. Let's all join our hands not to fall into the same trap again as uh, last year and uh, unduly restrict the movements of the, of the infrastructure which delivers the cargo to the port or away from the port. This is very important because otherwise the cost will be again painful to bear. Why did it take so long to address this? I mean, because it's very complex. Because so many uh, uh, government uh, institutions are part of it and they had to coordinate. And then even, I think, uh, on the side of private of the private, uh, private sector, it actually took quite a long time for the private sector and for the chambers themselves to realize the, the impact. It was completely underestimated for the longest time. And only after a while, the impact, as the pain started to be felt, right, on cost increases, uh, on, on congestion, on reputation and uh, a lot of other issues than you had in reaction. So it took quite a while. Doris, you look ready to jump in. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, was, I just wanted to comment uh, from Michael, to take off from Michael, and also to take off from the PPP story. I, mean, I was just impressed, I think what you said about the airports, that the lack of sort of the planning, I don't know the words, you were very diplomatic. But in listening to the list of your PPPs, reminds me of one of the issues that I think causes w the reason why our ports maybe are rated low. And that's because every single mayor wants an airport and every single mayor wants a port. And, and it's very hard for um, the, it's very hard for Congress or anybody to tell, or the Port Authority to tell the congressman, you can't have a port because then they want their budgets. So, the way we're, the reason, in the end, you end up having every, everybody put a little port, which is a lousy port. While what, what we're saying is, we should first identify where we're going to have our production clusters. Where are we going to put that port? Because once that is clear, once it is clear, you will have modern ports. I mean, we do have modern ports. ICTSI, ATI, these are modern ports. They have very good productivity. They have their, their international standards all the way. But... All the other ports are all too many, too many airports, too many this. While we think you create one hub airport, one hub port, and let all roads lead to that. That seems very logical. Why is that not the case? No, because, because, because every mayor wants his own So port. there's no central authority that can It's actually... very hard for somebody to say to a mayor, I'm sorry, you're not getting your port, because when they vote, when they vote uh, in Congress, let's say, or a congressman, when they vote for the budget, that congressman's not gonna be supportive of the Port Authority. Am I right? He's laughing. Everybody laughs with, when I say that. We should do hubs, we should decide, okay. Northern Mindanao, let's make Cagayan de Oro the one. Southern, let's do Jensan and Davao. But let's make those really international in class. Is that part of NEDA's planning? or DPWH in terms of infrastructure? Who, could, who can do central planning like that? Of course, certainly there, is, there are master plans. There are a nationwide program of which, where these are best located, airports, ports. I can see the OTC here. Uh, but yes, uh, the, the ones I outlined are those being pursued as PPP. I know that there are ports and other airports development. They're not being pursued as PPP. But yes, I understand also the concern because when we actually go to the local governments, to the local communities and talk about these prospective projects there, the you know, local leaders there would have their own, you know, as I was saying to them on the side here, everybody wants a, a port and an airport and a water district in its own area. But, you know. <laughs> but please. I, I would just like to clarify that for the Philippines, there is indeed a national airports master plan that does exist. Yes. Uh, and has been uh, supported by the Department of Transport and Communications. Now that master plan, uh, it lists all the airports of the country, it categorises those airports into different types of airports, domestic airports, feeder airports, international airports, etc. The plan is there. Uh, I think the difficulty is that not many people really know that plan exists, I and mean, then not that many people want to follow that plan. Right. Uh, as, as was mentioned before, the, the, 
the local mayors and that have their own ideas and want to push their own agendas. But actually, there is a nationally coordinated plan that does exist. I guess let me ask about that. The plan exists, the implementation is lagging, and largely because the implementation goes to local government. And for example, in Tacloban, uh, hit by Haiyan, uh, Yolanda, and that airport clogged. Uh, it, just, it just had to get fixed, and it could have been fixed in another country. That fix could happen in a week. In our country, it took months. What are the things that stop speedy? If the plan is there, why is it not executed? What do you want to see happen that can actually make things move faster? Well, I, I think emergency situations are definitely a separate case. I mean, everybody will respond uh, to an emergency situation like, like that. So uh, it's not the norm. And, you know, the simple facts are that um, Airports are very expensive. There's, there are a lot of airports in any one country in, norm, in a normal situation. And, you know, government has only limited funds to actually distribute amongst the various demands that it has. And airports are not normally on the top of the list, to be honest with you. And this is why privatisation has, has come forward as a means of solving the problem. Because actually airports are very important for economic development but the government just doesn't have the funds to, uh, to fund them, and uh, its funds are directed to other sectors, such as uh, police, such as health, uh, and, and other things like that. Um, so I, I think that the privatisation route is one uh, solution, and it's already been started in this country. It just needs to be taken forward in a more robust fashion. Um, and. I think uh, there's a lot of potential for that. Now, I mentioned before about Mactan Cebu International Airport. It was not the full privatisation of the airport. It was only the passenger terminal and a new passenger terminal to be built next to it. So um, there is another step that could be taken, and that is to privatise the whole of the airport, because actually an airport is very much an integrated operation. Uh, so just partial privatisation actually does lead to certain difficulties. Other countries have gone down the path of full privatisation of their airport assets, like Australia, like India, for example, and they have been very, very successful. And what the governments need to do, the government departments, which have been previously involved in the service provision, as, as in the operation and management, they need to step back under privatisation and they need to transform themselves into being an economic regulator, a safety regulator, uh, and, uh, you know, change their role, change their perspective uh, on what they, what they need to do for this particular airport sector. So I'll pick up that theme um, just at the anniversary of EDSA. We don't have anyone on roads, but there must be another panel. Uh, on Maybe no, I was going to say Michael is an expert in that uh, change of the functions of some of the government agencies, like the PPA. Please. PPA. Well, obviously, a government agency which is in the business should not be the regulator at the same time. So I think that pertains to uh, Philippine Ports Authority, for example, but also aviation is, uh, is, a, is a part of that. Because there is a clear conflict of, uh, a conflict of uh, interest, right? Um, what else do I have to say to that? Well, one of the uh, recommendations...